Hi everybody, um, welcome to you all. Um, I'm just going to stop square and share my screen and show you all of our faces. I think you can see them already. Um, so welcome along to our first session of this consultation. Welcome back for those who have previously been um, along to some of these webinars um, for different, different pieces of work that we've been doing and welcome to all of the people who haven't. It's lovely to have you here. We've got an hour today to talk through um, the forthcoming consultation or the consultation that's live now for the um, Greater Cambridge Local Plan. Um, and this is a bit of an introduction to the plan. It's a little bit about how to comment, how to get involved um, and some of the dates and some of the events that we're going to be doing. So we've got a team here today, some of the panel to talk to you about different things. And we're going to try and make it a little bit interactive. We've got some new technology, so I say, that we're going to try out this time. So bear with us. As always, we'd like to try a few new things to make it a little bit less of us just talking at you and you guys more being involved. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to just run through our panel and introduce them to you first, and then we'll do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll crack on. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to introduce them one by one. Um, Hannah. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Loftus. I'm engagement and communications lead at the Shared Planning Service and been working on kind of putting all of this consultation process together uh, with the team. Thank you, Hannah, and thanks for being here. Um, Mark. Hello all, I'm Mark Dees. I'm a Senior Planning uh, Policy Officer with the Shared Planning Service. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. Um, Mairead? Well, hi, I'm Mairead Sullivan. I'm also a Senior Planning Policy Officer with the Shared Service. Thank you, Mairead. And John? Hello, uh, I'm John Dixon, the Planning Policy Manager. Hey, John. Um, behind the scenes, I'm going to introduce the two. We've got two, two of our colleagues behind the scenes running all the technology, and without this, they, without them, this wouldn't be working. So we've got Will Smeaton and Tim Cliff who are running the technology. So we can either be thankful that they get it all right, or we can blame them if it all goes wrong. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. And so for me, I'm Paul Frayner. I'm Assistant Director for Strategy Economy, so part of the team who are helping to prepare the plan. Um, so about the session, just to reassure, it's being recorded. Um, there isn't any chat facility on here, but there is a Q&A. And what we'd encourage you to do is put any questions into the Q&A as we go through slides and we go through the, um, the interactive sessions. And we'll try and answer as many as we can as we go through. But we will have some time at the end, hopefully 15, 20 minutes, to um, do some question and answers as well. Um, and I think that you can post anonymously or I think you can use your name. We'll try not to mention names. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. We've got a few slides to present to you just on the stage of where we are at at the moment. And I'm going to hand over to John Dixon, who's going to start walking through those slides with you now. Um, oh, actually, just before we do that, I'm just going to outline the session. So just to outline what we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit of about what the stage of the plan making we're at. And then I'm going to do a little session on, on plan making demystification for all of you, those of you who don't know what the plan is about um, and that's going to be interactive and then we're going to talk a little bit about consultation how to participate and outline some of the next sessions including further webinars and some of our in real life sessions as well so john i'm going to hand over to you um, and you can start so as a reminder of where we are in this process this isn't very much not the beginning of the process we started plan making ooh, far back as 2019 i think we started uh you might remember in early 2020 uh we did our first conversation and we held many events just like this one and we generated an awful lot of feedback um over eight and a half thousand comments uh all of which have been published on our website you can find all that information um We've also since then uh, published some further research on the plan. So back in uh, November uh, last year, we published a series of studies that we've done to inform the plan and some of the testing we've done on the choices that would be available to the plan. And since then, we've been working up what the first proposals for the plan should be for this consultation. Um, after we'd worked those up as 
as officers, clearly they then go through a democratic process. We went through, oh, I think at least four meetings with, with councillors who discussed, agreed, made changes, scrutinized the documents to agree them for consultation that's now started. And we're now just into the six week consultation we're carrying out. Um, just an early reminder of where we are. This is not the final plan. This is very much the proposals we would use to develop the plan before we then consult you on it um, next year. So what you can see at the bottom of the screen is our overall timeline, uh, which shows we would consult next year on the draft plan. That would then lead to a plan that we would want to submit for adoption. So our final plan that we want to adopt, and then that would then be sent off uh, to the Secretary of State and there'll be an independent examination with an independent planning inspector to scrutinize the plan and listen to all the uh, representations that come in at that point uh, before a report would come to us um, as to whether the plan is sound and we can go on to adopt. We've got more on this later in the presentation, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what does it do? Hopefully you may have had a chance already to look on our website and have a look at the consultation for yourselves, but it tries to set out uh, the vision and the aims for our plan. What do we think this area should look like over the next 20, 30 years and how should we guide uh, what that should look like through our, our proposals in the plan. It sets out the overall amount of development we should plan for in the period to 2041. So that's the number of homes, number of jobs, but also what infrastructure should go with those. It sets out where we think uh, that development should take place and clearly seeks your views on those proposals, but also the key policies that would drive how that development takes place. What, what should be like? What standards should it meet, for example? And again, it's not a full plan. You will see when you look at that consultation, it sets out what we propose to prepare, not the full detailed policy wording and site details that we would have in a final plan. Um, the other thing to point out is that all the evidence we've used to help us prepare this plan is available on the website. There are many studies and topic papers where we've pr tried provide in great detail the background to those proposals, it's not just our proposals, it's why and the evidence behind them. So you have that available uh, should you choose to comment as well. And I'll hand back to Paul. Thanks very much, John. And I'm just gonna come off the, the screen share now and um, we're gonna move to uh, what we're gonna try is a little bit of an interactive session just to get you thinking really um, about, about the plan and, and try and help you um, see where we're at. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to try this now, and let's hope I'm, we're going to be using something called Mentimeter. Um, now Mentimeter, for some of you who've used it before, is fairly simple. We think to to use. I've I've managed to get through it myself to to, to put these together. So we'll have a go at it anyway. Um, so if you can see my screen now, and you can do it a number of ways. You can either go to www.menti.com, type in the code. Um, and it will take you to the, the page, or you can use this QR, QR code that you can see now, um, and hopefully you can all see that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move to the first question on Mentimeter, and which is this. So for everybody, and hopefully when you start putting your answers up, you should be able to see them come up on, on the screen. So in three words, what do you think? that a local plan actually plans for. So you can see our little diagram on the side there that's, that's part of our infographics that you know we think this is what um, this is what we're trying to plan for and this is what goes into the local plan and I appreciate that lots of you have seen some of the documents already and there is a, a lot of stuff in there already and um, a lot of information, a lot of evidence, a lot of a lot of wording. So what are the things that we're thinking of? And don't just copy the ones on the side on the tree. So we've got some new homes. I'm not seeing a huge amount coming through. Employment. Yeah, absolutely. I think employment and homes are obviously really, really key. Um, and growth is an interesting word because obviously growth means lots of different things. You know, population growth requires new development, new housing. And we need to, you know, we need to plan for the future, for the future generations to ensure that they have got houses and they've got places to work and, you know, new homes to live in. Um, nice places, definitely. And as you'll see from some of our documentation you know great places is one of the key themes of this plan um you know biodiversity and green spaces another key area 
And I think one of the really big um, topics that we're really you know, battling with with this plan that's maybe been slightly different from previous plans is is climate change. And we know that this is a, a significant issue for everybody. I mean, and um, planning has got a huge role to play in that. Um, you know, it's not the only tool that we're going to use to solve some of these complex challenges, but it certainly is very much one of them. And it's really been at the heart of what we're trying to put into the plan. Some really good stuff coming here. Yeah, transport, homes, green spaces, anti-discrimination i mean that's a really good one and i think one of the things for us that we've really tried to be thinking about in this plan is how that we try and as we've got in this in this slide is demystify the process of planning so actually we can get people involved and get people to understand that it's not just kind of dry boring stuff um john will frown at me about you know putting houses in places but actually it's really about place making and it's really you know it's a really you know to, to try and plan in uncertainty that we have in, in you know in our times at the moment is really tricky but actually we have to do that job and we have to do yeah you know, as, as well as we can but what we really need to do is try and get as many people involved in the process as possible and Hannah a little bit later we'll be talking about why it's so important to get involved in the consultation and, and to put your thoughts in and to try and get involved and there are things that you know are really important that, that communities can engage with in the planning making processes and though some things aren't aren't so easy to engage with so some other ones in their history history is a really a really important one as well because we build you know plans are an iterative process you know each plan we've got currently got two adopted plans for south cambridge and, and cambridge city and we're going to try and build on those as well and you know we don't want to throw out good stuff we want to improve on on that and move it forward so it's really important that we have lots of diversity there's some great stuff coming through here mm. so it's really interesting that one of, one of them that's come up is making developers money. And that, that's actually quite important because we do need to make sure development that comes through is viable. But, but a key role of the plan is to make sure that it seeks contributions from development towards the uh, infrastructure needs, the open spaces, the transport that's needs that are generated by those developments. And that's actually a key role of the plan to set out what those needs are, what those costs are, and the funding that should come from development. So everybody knows up front what the expectations of, of developers are to help them bring forward developments, but also communities know what will come with development, not just the housing, but that it will be supported. I think it's really interesting to see transport really central here, because actually transport is one thing that the local plan doesn't actually plan for itself. We take account of transport plans, but it isn't the transport plan, which is something that I think as planners we do struggle with. I think, you know, we have a system that we work within um, and transport sits at the level of different authorities. So in our area, we've actually got a lot of different levels of local authorities that have transport uh, roles. So we have uh, the combined authority at the macro level. We have the county council sort of in between, and we also have the Greater Cambridge Partnership and they'll be consulting on some really important transport proposals starting, I believe, on Monday now, in actual fact. So we, we work really closely with those transport authorities, but we aren't the transport planners ourselves. Um, we have to try and make sure that our plan meshes with those other local transport plans as seamlessly as possible. Um, but it's actually something we can't plan for in this plan. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Um, so some fantastic stuff coming through and just to let you know obviously the the you know the, the you know the stuff that you're putting in here we will capture that we are capturing all of this stuff and we're trying to get inside because actually we're even going to try and build in some you know conversations that are going to feed into the next webinars and the next session so we can actually consider a lot of this stuff and, and part of the process of consultation is listening to this and you know hearing some voices in different ways so I'm going to move on to the next one now so um we have got another another slide for you to interact with another one to get you thinking and um, so this is the next one so this is always a question that we get asked quite a lot um, and gets a lot of a lot of questions around it so who do you think and who does everybody think who does one think that um, gets to decide if a local plan should be adopted or not and you know there's a wide range of people who are involved in in making and and examining and viewing local plans you know, but I've, I've given you a few options there. I mean, if there are other options that you think might be in there, you can always put that into the Q&A. Um, so we've got a couple there already coming through from, from the planning inspector. And just to just to 
give you some context of who you think these people are. The officers who write the plan is, is essentially us and um, all the people in front of you now. So we've got some of our plan policy planning team, John and Maraid and Mark, um, and, uh, and all of us who are involved in making the plan. Uh, the planning inspector in government are part of um, MHCLG and they inspect plans, that's correct. Um, and our elected council members, and you've got to remember that we had a little complicated system here because we work for two councils. So we've got lots of elected members, so both councils and both council processes, um, and they make the decisions on behalf of the council. So we've got one saying that developers decide the plan um, as well. So that's something more coming through at the moment. So I think this is a bit of a trick question, but I think you've got it right um, broadly, most of you have voted. Um, it, is, it is decided, essentially adopted, by elected members. I mean, we will draft the plan and we will make our, the plan is drafted on our evidence base and the con consultation and the process in which, you know, we have been going through for the last 18 months and will continue to go through for the next 18 months. When we have a plan that we believe is the, you know, as John described in, in the previous slides, as the final, final submission that we've got to, I think that will be in two years time. We will then submit that to the, the Secretary of State and the Planning Inspector who will, who will examine that to find if it's sound. And if such that it is found sound and it's examined and found to be sound and is deliverable, then we will then take that through our council processes and the elected members would then decide whether that plan was adopted or not. So absolutely, and, and, and you'll all be pleased to know it isn't the developers who decide the plan um, or adopt it. Um, that's something certainly that, that doesn't happen. Um, so moving on to the final slide before we go back into a few more sessions. This isn't interactive, but it's something we really wanted you to think about um, as we go through this consultation and feedback to us. Um, and you know, you, you'll have details of how to contact us, how to give us comments, how to you know feedback informally as well. But but a really important thing is to think about when we're that we're always trying to ask ourselves a question. We're always asking ourselves as we as we're trying to draft this, and actually it's really helpful to kind of you know tell, tell you what we think is good for us to hear from you is what you think makes a good local plan. And you've said some good, really interesting comments in the first slide, but when you're responding to the consultation, it'd be really helpful for us to understand what you guys think is making a good local plan, because there are some things that it's required to do from a statutory perspective, but there are also lots of things that it, it could do or it could talk to that are really important from your perspective. Unless we know those things, we can't try and integrate them into the plan. Um, so yeah, if you can think about that while you're while you're commenting, and that'd be really really useful. So I'm going to come out of this now. Thanks for that interaction. Hopefully that did work okay. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move back over into um, into just our view. I think this is a bit more of a dry technical view um, on what is kind of legally considered um, a, a statutory sound local plan. I'm going to pass to John, who's going to who's going to um, who's Going to, who's going to talk you through that. Um, John, I'm just going to share my screen on that slide and hopefully you should all be able to see it. And John, you can talk us through this. So this is a rather technical, wordy slide about what a plan's got to achieve before it's considered sound. So sound is the word that's used in national government guidance as to what an adoptable plan must be, if it's a suitable, um, ready to go, uh, does all it needs to do. And that, that is then defined uh, in national planning policy about what sound means with those four criteria. So that planning inspector mentioned, we mentioned on the earlier slide, that's one of their core roles to see if the plan is sound and the plan can be moved on to be adopted by the councils. So the first test of soundness, is it positively prepared? And in summary, that means, does it respond to the needs of the area or the issues facing the area um, positively? Does it, does it meet those needs? And in some cases, does it also even meet the needs of surrounding areas that couldn't meet their own needs? Um, and these, these are real issues. So part of our process is we have to very much talk to our neighbours and understand what the issues facing surrounding areas as well, as well are, not just our own areas, to demonstrate we've positively responded to the challenges and issues and opportunities facing our area. We also need to be able to justify what's in the plan. So is it 
an appropriate strategy that responds to those issues and opportunities uh, that I've just mentioned? Have we considered the alternatives that are available to us and the choices that were available to us through plan making? And part of that is demonstrating that through a proportionate evidence base. So we've got a document library we've published as part of the consultation, which documents all the evidence base we've prepared up to this point to show um, what, what's behind the, our thinking at the moment. And it, and it is extensive. We do live in a, a complex part of the world. We've got to deal with a range of very challenging issues. So you'll find a very extensive number of documents already in our evidence list, and that will keep growing as we go through the process. The next test we have to pass is, is the plan effective? Have we demonstrated uh, that the uh, policy proposals and sites we put in the plan will deliver to meet the needs we've identified? Is it effective in working with uh, partners on the strategic issues we've identified uh, through the area? Have we demonstrated that we work properly with our uh, you know, the other major uh, government bodies in the area, environment agency, for example, have we worked effectively with them through the process? And we demonstrate that through something complicated called a statement of common ground, which is effectively just a statement to show we all agree or don't agree how we've worked together. And then a very important one at the end is, uh, is it consistent with national policy? So the government publishes what's called a national planning policy framework, uh, supported by other guidance, uh, which sets out what they expect uh, plans across the country to be achieving. They set out some high level planning policies that would apply to all developments and they set out what they expect local plans to do. And we need to demonstrate how we've responded to that, that policy guidance appropriately with our plan. And our inspector will almost be guided by those requirements uh, in, in testing the plan as well. So one of the things we do when we get further down the line is to document how we've responded to national policy, almost line by line or paragraph by paragraph, or at least to show we have effectively responded to government policy. So we need to effectively pass all these tests and show the inspector at the end of the process that we've done this. And in responding to comments, something we'd recommend to uh, people responding to do is have these in mind. So when we get to those more formal stages of the plan making process later down the line, inspectors will want to know from people making comments, well, which soundness test do you think the plan hasn't achieved or which has it achieved if you're supporting the plan? So these do become important further down the line when we get into most more technical phases, but it doesn't mean they're not useful now to have in mind when you're making comments at this stage. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much, John. Um, yeah, really, really useful to consider those. And, and as usual, John, you've done an excellent job of explaining some incredibly complex stuff in, an, in good, simple terms. Um, it's always the battle. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah now, who's going to, who's going to talk a little bit about why, why, why you want to get involved and why, why people would like to get involved. And bearing in mind this, this is recorded, you know, if there's people who haven't been able to make it today you think might be interested in this, please do share the link to the, to the webinar, which will put it up and you know, try and get people to get involved. Um, especially those people who might not necessarily think it's relevant to them. Um, so I'll pass over to Hannah. Thanks, Paul. I was just going to start off actually by talking about some of the overarching principles that govern the way that we look at consultation. Um, some of you, if you're nerds like me, will be familiar with the, what's known as the gunning principles. And these were actually a series of principles that were established about consultation um, through actually a, a court case where a case was brought to say that a public authority had not done what was felt to be by the complainant proper consultation. Um, and it was actually really interesting because it was the first time that anyone had been asked what makes a consultation? What actually is consultation? What makes a legitimate consultation? And, and the QC who was presiding over the case, Stephen Sedley, um, essentially summed it up in these four principles that these are what makes a consultation, a, a kind of a reasonable consultation, a, a consultation that is meaningful. So firstly, that the consultation must take place when the proposals are still at a formative stage. So you can actually, you know, they're not set in stone, whatever it is that you're consulting on, changes can be made. Um, but secondly, we must put forward enough reasons for the people who are 
being consulted to actually respond with the with, with enough information so you can't just be asked kind of questions to say well do you like this or that and the other and have no background or, or no information for you to be able to understand those proposals thirdly adequate time for consideration and response so you know it's no point in consulting on something and then a week later coming out with the final plans clearly you haven't given enough time for those consultation responses to be thought about and fourthly that the product of the consultation must be conscientiously taken into account and I think for us this is really important um, that, it, that what you tell us um, gets poured over in, in a, a huge amount of detail and we think about it very very seriously um, and that's really important as important as what we hear from everybody is what we do with the information that you give us how we consider that. Uh, next slide please. So some of the things that we really value um, from what we get from consultation and engagement. So firstly, really, it is that insight that you bring us. So we really need to know and, and we, we need that information that only you have. That's a really valuable part of the insight that we bring to the plan. You know things about your local area that we aren't necessarily going to be able to know or through the sort of more technical documentation at that granular nature of particular aspects of locality might not come through but you also know things like what you do on a daily basis where you go how you travel what would or wouldn't incentivize you to do things differently maybe in the future how you make decisions about your life um, and Again, when you're commenting on the consultation, we, we really value that insight that you bring. So please tell us those things that we kind of can't find out any other way. We, we look on work on, with the Environment Agency, we work with highways, we work with a lot of technical agencies, but that's not the same as that insight into the citizens that make up our community. Next one. Again, then, Building on that insight, you know, so that insight is in a way part of evidence, but there's other evidence that you may hold that can help us either prove or disprove the hypothesis that we come with, because what we're trying to do here is, is really test our thinking. We've used the evidence that we have that's available to us, the advice of various experts to help come up with these proposals. Um, but if you have some evidence that you think is material that you think might actually change that then please bring it to the table so that might be some data if you work with an organization that collects data of some sort that might be really helpful um, that could be some reports or some other things that we might not be aware of you know we, we've talked about the role of local history and how some of that information is really valuable there are, you know there are limits to how much we have been able to you know we only have a team of certain people to be able to do to bring on that and so if there's information that you know is buried in an archive somewhere that we might not have realized please bring that to the table and that's really helpful the next one then testing it so a plan is a tool it's a tool for us as planners to try and get the best possible outcomes for our area and like any toolbox it's got a lot of different aspects to it and we want to know whether they're really going to work. And that's working for all the different users of the plan, because the plan is used by regular citizens as something that you can consult, that you can see what those policies say, and they can help inform anything that you choose to do with your land, your buildings, anything from a house extension through to as a farmer or as someone with, with a big land holding what you choose to do. So you can tell us whether you think those policies are actually going to work, whether they're going to achieve the aims we hope them to achieve. And you can also just tell us whether you think you understand the plan. Is it clear enough? Is it something that people are going to be able to unambiguously use and interpret? That's really important to us. We want it to be as simple to understand as it can be. We know we can't avoid all of the technical jargon, but you know, fundamentally, if it's got ambiguities or it's got things that are not clear it's not going to be as effective as it should be in terms of being that tool to create great places and to create a great environment for you going forward next one 
Um, so yeah, I mean, this is just a little bit of an example of kind of improvement. We're trying to do things like, for instance, use more digital mapping, um, use better maps, better graphics that are better, more explanatory, help people understand what we're doing. So please feedback. It is a tool and we want to know how we can improve it, improve on what our last local plans have done to make this one a more streamlined and more effective part of the planning system. Next. So, and then the last is, you know, obviously this question of opinion. Do you like it? But I think it's really important to stress that consultation is not a referendum. And it's interesting to see some, some questions in the chat or some comments in the chat here about who gets to decide and the role of the citizen. Planning is a process of making really difficult trade-offs between different priorities and different aspects of the world that we live in. Um, and consultation isn't a referendum, um, thankfully, probably for many of us, I think we might have had enough of them for a bit. Um, and it is about justifying and understanding why you have the views that you have about parts of the plan. So when you do comment, please let us know why you think what you think, not just what you think, but actually why, because that's that insight that helps us to understand how to make the plan better, how to make it fit with your priorities, um, what do we need to adjust, how do we need to adjust it uh, in order to, to make it as robust and, and, and to balance those trade-offs as best as we possibly can. So it's really important to tell us please what you like as well as what you don't like. So you may like some policy ideas and not others, you may think some sites are appropriate and not others, it's just as important to tell us the bits that you think we should keep and hold on to, as well as the bits you think we should chuck out and start all over again on. So I think when I'd really just like to, to sort of end by saying, you know, it really matters uh, what you say, but it is definitely the reasons behind it, that insight that we're really seeking from you. I might just take the opportunity to answer a few of the um, of, of the questions I can see in the chat that deal with some of this question around consultation, because it is really interesting. Um, and one of the one of the questions that is about good consultation allowing for the kind of none of the above. And I think that is an, a really good point to be raised. And we absolutely welcome uh, comments that kind of are none of the above. So when we ask you to comment on it, there's the, in, in both the different forms of, of comments that you can leave, there, there is space for you to do that. We do welcome alternative proposals that you might come up with. Please do tell us about them. They are really important. We're not just, it's not a multiple choice answer. It's not saying, you know, you must choose this, that or the other. There is also that space to say, no, you know what? I don't think that any of these things are right, but here are some other ideas about how to do it. Um, question about how views are taken into account and I think we're going to come on to a little bit about what we do after the consultation aren't we Paul in, in a few other slides so I'll probably answer that uh, afterwards. Yeah absolutely and, and some of the questions I think and unfortunately I can't see the questions at the moment because I'm only sharing my slides but um, yeah I mean we're hopefully some of them will be answered in the second part of the session and, and we would pick them out mm. as we go forward. Um, so thanks very much Hannah and yeah and, and we totally all concur it's it's really important to get involved. I mean, we have tried really hard to to try and make it as understandable as possible. But I'm sure you know you'll all understand that the amount of work that goes into it in detail, we can't do any less. So I make no apologies for the amount of evidence that's been gathered. Really, it's really important that we do that too. So I know that you are super excited about this next part again. Um, I'm going to come off my screen share again. Um, I'm going to we're going to do another very short interactive session, um, which I hope that you'll. You know, you'll like just as much as I think you like the first one. And um, before we move on to, you know, to more formal questions, um, and it just is a little bit of picking up about how how to to think about feedback and how you might think about that in a way that's helpful for both, you know, for both both you and us, and how we can take that into consideration. So hopefully you can see my screen again. I'm really sorry that we've got two mentees. It's a different code this time, so you will have to enter a different code or scan that um, scan that QR code again. Um, I apologise about that. That's just our our, um, our naivety on Menti at the moment, and we'll be working on getting that better for next time. Um, so this time, first question is is just thinking about comments and just kind of building on what Hannah was saying. Really, 
um, you know, what do you think makes a helpful comment? And, you know, they're talking about the why you think about stuff. Why is it important for you to make that comment? Um, and I think this is something that, you know, we can kind of take other examples from in other parts of our lives. You know, we don't just comment and feedback on planning and actually, you know, actually planning's has the least feedback on it apart from other things. Other things get a lot more, a lot more energy, but maybe they don't, you know, we're not as good at presenting it in a way. So, you know, yes, context is is absolutely one that is specific to, you know, it's specific to many things. The planning is is um is is important in that fact. Saying no to something is pointless without stating an alternative. Yeah. And and that is true. And and like I think that others have said, you know, this is not an easy thing to do everybody involved in making plans has to consider it's, it's pretty much touches everything that that people do and it's it's looking into the future which we know is inherently difficult at any time but especially in 2021 um clear reasoning constructive feedback is really important uh, you know and and, and planning is quite a divisive topic you know we know it is you know we're all working it you know we all understand it but most of people working in planning certainly in in, in my experience are people who you know, care, genuinely care about making places better for people and, and constructive feedback is helpful. We're not always going to agree, but, you know, being able to communicate that and then feed it into the plan or feedback why we haven't been able to feed it into the plan is a really important part of that two-way process. Um, anyone anyone else on there pick out any other, other bits, Hannah, or others that you think are interesting that are coming through? Um, by evidence is great that that's coming through yeah and i think that maybe scroll down because i know someone put one in the chat which i put in for them which i thought was really nice oh i, I did type of it i'm sorry fairness honesty courtesy rationality fact and relevance i thought that was a really great answer and i think you know that's the kind of nature of the debate that we really hope to to have is that ability to kind of disagree with each other um in a way that is also uh, uh, has that courtesy uh, for sure yeah yeah I completely agree with that I mean backed up by evidence and I think that you know a lot of the stuff that we see around in in, in the media and in general at the moment not planning wise but in, in just in the times that we live in is very much uh, you know it's quite polarized in some some respects and what we've tried to do is you know planning is a process that really works for the basis of the most current and up-to-date evidence or facts as much as possible and it's you know it's fine to challenge those but actually you know doing it in a, in a kind of honest and, and uh, courteous way is really important, based on logical arguments. I mean, it's great to see that evidence is coming through so strongly there. And, and you know, that's something obviously that the policy planners here on, on, on the call and those also working in our team, obviously that's their, their life living in, in, in evidence-based work. You know, a lot of policy isn't written particularly evidence-based, but planning policy absolutely is because it's examined at the end of the process and has to, has to be so, so you know, really helpful comments and it'd be really fantastic to capture these actually as we as we feed and you know feed them back into the plan these are really interesting okay i'm going to move on to the second one now everybody thank you for sharing i think this has been really good to use momentum meeting i'm quite enjoying this actually it's really good um it's really good to see people engaging um so just a bit more broad a bit more of a broad question to you all and this is kind of kind of help us iterate i mean you'll know that we've been trying to um, bring forward a digital plan this one is moving forward to that process but you know that includes kind of the way that people like to engage with stuff now so we're really interested in how you like to leave feedback and that doesn't mean in terms of how you leave feedback on this consultation but you know any kind of feedback how do you consult with stuff you know I mean we've all had pretty horrific experiences or pretty good experiences quick comments are good, good and simple I mean I've had a recently had a really really bad experience with a with an application or something and leaving feedback, but also equally sometimes I think wow that was so super simple. Um, they've really got that right. They've really designed that well. They've really got the user design right right on that, um, and it's really helpful. And I can see how that's worked. Um, and I think that that's why we've tried to kind of mix it up with the way that we've consulted and and you know. I know that there's some some conversation around the, the way of having two kind of two forms of consultation and Hannah's going to talk about the kind of detailed comments and the quick survey that we're going to do in a little while but actually you know we want to give a broad range of people because not everyone's got the same preferences but we want to try and reach as many people as possible and take those into consideration so I think that we do need to have a swathe a broad swathe of ways to do that um, 
Anything else in there? Anyone else picked up anything from, from the panel on there that they're thinking unstructured? Yeah, unstructured is interesting because you get so much. This is one of the things that you know we, we're constantly trying to work out how we really how we get that breadth and richness of information that you get in unstructured comments, you know, and also then get the quantitative stuff as well, because there's a real mix there. And, and, and I think that that's a really important. Hannah, this is really your, up your street, but you know, what's your views on that? Yeah, I think we actually really welcome unstructured comments as well as structured comments. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And I think this is really learning from uh, how human beings work, that even if you ask people to, to be structured, sometimes they are unstructured anyway. So half the time, you know, in, in I think previous sort of more traditional formats, um, trying to, to sort of get people to be too structured can just lead to just almost as much work as, as just allowing people to be unstructured in the first place. Having said that, I think, you know, and this is something we will come on to, is that we want as many comments as possible. So having tools and, and ways that we can analyze them um, relatively easily is, is really important for us. Um, and it's really interesting to see online coming through actually pretty centrally here uh, because it makes it uh, a much easier process if we do have things online for the simple fact that when they're not, uh, we have to manually transcribe them into the database that we use to do that analysis. Um, and it's, you know, we're trying to learn from a lot of new tools here and we're trying to learn from a lot of other disciplines, other social research techniques, um, other, uh, other analysis techniques, which are quantitative, so involving numbers, but also kind of qualitative sentiment analysis and things like that. Um, and it is a constantly evolving field, but we do try to find the right ways to allow people to do things um, and, and make it as easy as possible. I think that's really interesting to see that coming through, like the fact that people want to do it simply, quickly, not expensive, concisely. Those all really resonate with us. Uh, yeah. The fewest clicks possible. Fewest clicks as possible, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> really one. that's such a massive aim of us, is to literally have the fewest clicks possible. Um, whilst we don't have to keep with, with our sorry. GDPR and, and so forth. And I think that that's yeah yeah absolutely and, and and actually some of the stuff that goes on behind that the use of kind of research work is really important in designing things with as few clicks as possible and there's some certainly some different skill sets coming into play here. Um, so thank you very much again for for all of your comments on 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 that and I'm gonna hand over just before we go to questions we're just gonna have a quick a quick run through I think before we go to the panel and some questions on just how how you can get involved in this particular. Yeah plan now and um hannah if i just share yeah. my screen i'm going to hand back over to you and then some of the others can get involved um let's we go let's see are we up and we yeah. are thank you so yeah so firstly how can you explore the proposal That's, well you've already found us here today so you've, you've definitely have managed that in some way or other um this is an online and offline method as well. So there are hard copies at local libraries and also actually at the two council offices, although they are only still open by uh, in, uh, um, appointment only. Um, and then we've worked quite hard to try and revamp our digital plan and our interactive mapping as well. And we really do welcome all feedback on this as well. So please do let us know what you think. Um, but we're hoping to try and make that relatively intuitive. So, for instance, if you click on something on the interactive map, it will bring up. Um, actually, I wonder if I could almost do a little demo of this now. I'm sorry, I'm springing this on, on Paul, who might say, no, don't. We didn't do this in our practice. <laughs> um, but I just wonder whether I could just do a little demonstration to show people how that works, because it. I'm, I think it's great. Uh, sorry so to, to speak for the team, but Tim actually who's on the doing technical behind the scenes today has worked really, really hard on this. Would that be okay, Paul, if I just shared my screen? Of course, if it's helpful for people for social. Um because I can just literally talk show you how that works as a um as an experience. So if you go to the um the, the, the interactive map web page, you'll get up this map. So this shows the uh 
all the site proposals and also the strategic green space projects that we propose in the area. And if you click on a point on the map, so let's just say here, it will bring you up a uh, little window like this. And if you click on the window on the on the arrow, it will bring you up a whole bunch of useful information about that site. And, you know, we've actually managed to link it up to digital plan. This is really exciting. I mean, it sounds like baby steps, but we're, you know, this is all kind of an improvement on what we've had before. So if you click on more information, that will take you straight through to the digital plan where you can read the whole of the kind of policy direction for that particular site or initiative. So just simple things like that. I'm going to stop showing my screen for so you can go back to your, your proper slides. But we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to explore that information, go backwards and forwards from, from the mapping to the written document and vice versa. Um, and then we have a number of different ways that you can comment as well. So, um, oh, yeah, if we go to the one before, maybe. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, next one. I think I've got a lag on my, my thing. Um, so, yeah, if you go to our local plan web page, that map is embedded there. You can also use the view the map link to view that kind of full screen. Explore the plan takes you to the full digital plan document. And then we have two ba basic ways to comment. So we have a really quick survey and then we have a more detailed comment facility for people who want to uh, go into greater depth and so forth. So the reason we have those two means is because we have such a diverse range of people who want to comment. So everybody from just regular people, normal members of the public, young people, old people, residents, people who might work in the area, students, through to our for more formal consultees. So they might be our parish councils, they might be our neighbouring local authorities, uh, Historic England, the Environment Agency. There's a lot of bodies who also get kind of involved with uh, commenting on a plan who aren't just people and, and all of their views are really important and valuable too. And of course, then there are landowners, developers, agents, professionals of different sorts who also want to put in their comments. So it's important that we do kind of cater for everyone as much as we can. Next, please. So the quick questionnaire, this is anonymous. We're at a relatively early stage of plan making. So we're still at regulation 18. Um, and that means that we can do this. So this is really designed, you know, it'll take 30 seconds on your mobile phone. It's a very, very quick questionnaire. And if you come to one of our in-person events or if you go to a library, you'll find a hard copy version of that as well, which you can just fill in um, and leave there at the library. They're collecting them for us. Or if you're at an event, just give it to one of us. Um, and that really focuses on the larger issues and the major sites of the plan. Obviously, it's not possible in, in 12 or 13 questions to cover or 400 pages of the plan. So we've tried to focus on the bits where we think people will have the most to say and be most interested. Then the next way of commenting is the more detailed comment facility. So that's, I think, shown on the next page. So at the end of each page on the digital plan, you can see there's a little speech bubble. And if you click on that speech bubble, you'll bring up uh, a, a box to start logging in and leaving your detailed comments. So that does require us you to, to log in and register. And the reason for that is because this is really aimed at those, if you like, more detailed technical answers that people may have. So for instance, if you're a parish council and you're commenting on a site, it's actually quite important that we, be, we can track that response back to you as a parish council because you come with a particular role in the process and a particular um, perspective. And if we want to follow up on your questions, um, we obviously need to know that it's you that's put them in and how to get hold of you and so forth. So we would encourage people to use whichever way they think is best. Um, and we do are asking people to respond online if at all possible. Um, and because it, it does make our life um, a, a lot more consistent. If you send us um, sort of free form answers by email, we have to transcribe them into the system to ensure that we analyze them alongside all of the other comments. We have to then try to assign them to the specific bits of the plan we think you're commenting on. So we need to kind of read them and say, well, we think this comment is relevant to climate change, but maybe this person actually means this comment in the con context of some other bit of the plan. And it, it is quite complicated for us to do that analysis. And it, and it helps us interpret your comments correctly if they are left against the right 
page or the right policy in the plan. It really does help a lot. Now, I'm really aware that we've got, we're getting to the end of time. So I'm going to just skip to a few of the questions that are in the, the chat, which relate to this question about how we, um, how we comment and so forth. Um, so someone has said, I like to leave thoughtful feedback by email at whatever length is needed to make the points and to receive feedback on the content of the email, but also via email with a paper trail. That's a really great point. And I think we love, we, we want to get that thoughtful feedback. Last consultation, however, we did get about eight and a half thousand comments. So it isn't possible for us to comment back to each person individually about the answer that they give. However, we do publish our consultation statement and the consultation statement does tell you how every comment has been taken into account. They're grouped. So when comments raise a similar issue, um, that it's, it, it's, it's an issues based analysis. But if you read the the consultation statement which is open on um, it's published on our, our website as well you can see how your comments are taken into account um, and that is essentially that sort of paper trail that you're asking for about how that feedback that you've given is taken into account uh, there's a question which was a little earlier that says why do we think that people generally don't feel that they're listened to or their views are taken into account despite the consultation process that's a brilliant question as well. And we really acknowledge that that can seem like the case a lot of the time. And I think this is where this question about what you comment on and how you comment, what sort of reasoning and, and so forth you bring to us really matters because we have to create a plan that as John outlined, it's sound. When it gets to that examination stage, we can show that it's really well evidenced and that it's kind of incontrovertible as far as possible. Um, so we're, we couldn't really put forward a plan and, and the justification being, well, someone just said they didn't like this, so we didn't put it in. Like, unfortunately, that's just not going to be enough evidence for us. So this is where I think the views are really taken into account. For instance, it really helped us to know from the first conversation consultation that we held early 2020 what people thought about climate change, what people thought was really important about that. That's helped us kind of push that up the agenda in terms of the plan, you know, that people thought it was a top priority, makes us bolder and braver about how we take that forward. So that's an example of, of consultation responses really counting. You know, for instance, if that had been the other way around, if people had said, well, climate change, you know, we, we just don't think it's a big priority. We know that government is asking us to deal with climate change. It's not like we can't deal with it as an issue, but maybe we wouldn't be as confident about sort of being a bit more envelope pushing about how we deal with climate change as a result. Um, I'll just see if I can see any other consultation response related questions up here. Um, I mean, back at the early stage when we were talking about who decides on a plan, there's really interesting ones about the electorate making the decision and residents should decide who, if, if a plan is adopted. So in a neighborhood plan, that is kind of the, the way it works. In a neighborhood plan, you get a neighborhood referendum um, and the neighborhood does get to vote on that. For a local plan, that's just not the system we work in. Um, and people may have different views on whether that's correct or not, but we uh, lowly planners sadly can't change that system for, from central government that says that it's not the electorate that makes the decision. And I suppose the rationale there is Sometimes we have to make really difficult decisions for the greater good of, of the country, the planet, lots of other factors that may not always be popular. Um, you know, we've got to be honest about that. We know that it's not always popular. Um, and, 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 you know, we know that it can be really difficult sometimes uh, to get uh, those things on a very local level may feel, feel hard to swallow, even though potentially for the longer term or the future generations, uh, that might, might be really important. And that brings me on to the last consultation related question I can see, which is about canvassing the views of people most likely to benefit from new development, i.e. the next generation and people outside the region. And I think this is a really great point to raise because we are actually trying really hard to get those views. Um, to reach beyond the kind of people who normally respond to consultations who have plenty of time on their hands. 
because this is a 20 year plan, actually almost a 30 year plan on, on many levels. And the NPPF requires us to look forward 30 years. So this is a plan for Gen Z. This is not a plan really for even people like me who are in, in our forties here. It is a plan for, for people who are growing up at the moment. Um, so we're, we're trying to work very hard. In fact, I spent yesterday evening with uh, youth club groups um, in part of our area, talking to those very people about what they hope for, fear for in their future, what makes a good place for them to live, what kind of housing they're interested in living in in the future. Really interesting conversations. And we really welcome any opportunities or any ideas that people have or any groups that people would like us to go talk to um, within our capacity to do that. We are prioritizing young people actually at this consultation in a really major way. So yeah, but we're trying hard. It isn't easy always to get, get that feedback and get that input, but we're really trying to do that and, and to sort of raise that, that their voices up the agenda. I think that's me done, Paula, those, those questions, unless you can see others. No, right. thanks for thanks very much, Anna. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll if people are happy to stay on, we'll run over a couple of mm -hmm. minutes because there are a lot of questions. Really keen to kind of answer them. And I'm not sure how we're running this this time. In though, in terms of the ones we haven't, we don't get to in time. I will amalgamate them, and I'm sure that some of them will be either FAQs that we can point to or something that we can add to our FAQ section on the website. And um, if we don't actually get to those questions in time. Um, I'll, before we do go, I'll bring up the slide again just to show you how to get in contact um, and who, who to get in contact with and what the best way of doing that is. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to run through a couple of the questions as, as well now um, as, and try and get some of the other panel involved. We are we have tried to answer as many as we can going through. As Hannah said, this is the first session, so specific comments on specific kind of parts of the plan. We should be able to pick them up in, 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 the, in the other sessions. We've got two sessions next week, one in terms of exploring the development numbers and the jobs and homes, and one about the strategy, and then one on climate change the following week, and the following week after that, we've got biodiversity and green spaces. Um, so the question I think I'm gonna hand over to John to answer is, how can we be confident you've included everything relevant in the local plan and on your map? John. Sorry, could you say that again, Paul? I couldn't hear you. You're kind of quiet. Sorry, am I quiet? That's You're very a bit unusual. Quiet. I will come. come <laughs> so, how can you be? How can we be confident you have included everything relevant in the local plan and on your map? That's a great question. Um, so, we very much try, as you say, we've been working on this plan for oh, 18 months or more, and we start off very much from trying to scope the plan. So, what should it cover? And we use the early stages of consultation to try and help us identify all the issues uh, that we need to be covering. And that's another reason why the representations were uh, really helpful. So we've tried to scope in issues raised through consultations, issues we're required to look at through uh, national planning guidance and other local issues, uh, issues that other local organisations or bodies say we should cover. But it's very much the opportunity in this consultation to say if you believe something's been missed so that's why we asked for at this early stage and we want to hear before we get to that stage of actually writing the plans one of the real aims of this part I, I think this question may be related to a few other questions I see about the wastewater treatment plant site relocation um, which I know is an issue that many people are concerned about so for those who aren't aware this is the proposal from Anglian Water to relocate the Cambridge wastewater treatment plant from the current site in northeast Cambridge to a new site uh, near Hornsey and Penditton um, and I think maybe it would just help for us to cover off a few of those questions um, now because there are a number in, in the chat at once uh, that relate to each other um, and I think that the, there is a question about why we don't show that on our local plan maps and what information is in the local plan documentation about the relocation project. So we understand absolutely where this question comes from because in the minds of the public and, and, and understandably so you may think these things are intrinsically linked and we should show them on our map. However, the wastewater treatment plant is not part of the local plan. It is a completely separate planning process because it's a nationally significant infrastructure project. So its process is not decided 
through the local plan, or indeed it is not decided by us as local authorities either. It is a development consent order process that goes through to central government. So it is similar to other large projects in the area, for instance, East West Rail, which we also don't show on the local plan map because those are projects that are outside of, and this comes to this thing about what does a plan plan for? Unfortunately, or well, unfortunately from your perspective maybe is the question of it from the system that we're in, we don't plan for those. So if we show them on our map, where do we stop? Do we then start showing all sorts of other proposals from all sorts of other people or parties that may or may not come to fruition in the fullness of time and so forth. So we simply can't show them on our, our map, otherwise that's the trap we fall into. Um, but we do acknowledge that there's a relationship between the proposals at North East Cambridge and the wastewater treatment plant relocation, and that is considered in the sustainability appraisal of the local plan. So it is not that we don't uh, have some, you know, have, have mindfulness to some of those wider impacts and wider questions, but they can't be because it is not a plan project, a plan proposal. They cannot be put on our map in the same way as the other proposals that are actually policy proposals in the plan. And I know that we have a frequently asked question on our website about this as well. So if anybody wants to read more about the relationship between those two, then please do visit our website um, and go to the frequently asked questions page and there will be more information for you there. Absolutely, Hannah, and that's picked up a couple of questions in there. Um, got one here about planning land use over a reasonable horizon, say 100 years, and the impact on the environment over that period. And I think it's really interesting, we, you know, you know, we find it very difficult to plan over a couple of months with most of our lives with the uncertainty that goes on and planning yet has to take into consideration quite a long term piece and especially with climate. Um, you know, John or, or Mark, you, would, you, would you talk to that, that comment? Uh, well, I think um, it, it's a difficult one in the way that we want to plan for a reasonable length of time, but the further you get ahead, the more uncertainty you have in that longer term period. So it's about finding that balance. And the 20 year plan, we think, and actually the government in their guidance thinks it's around the right sort of timeline as well, 15 years or so, is about the right length of time when you can plan for that level of certainty. But we don't just stop there. We do look further ahead about the longer timeline. That's another issue the government is highlighted to looking at slightly longer term. So we're trying to look in more detail at that 15, 20 year period, but have an eye to the longer term because we've, that's the most effective period to plan for. Um, thanks very much, John. And I mean, uh, th there's a lot of questions in here that will probably get discussed in some of the later webinars as well. I think we've got through quite a few, but actually a lot of the detail and the technical details certainly around you know, the housing numbers and the way that we've looked at growth that's going to be picked up next week. A, a question, a couple of questions around consultation and, and just and our own experiences of that, because this is something that's, you know, this obviously this session is for that to kind of ask the questions about how we consult. And one of the things that we've been asked in advance really is, is why we've chosen the places that we've gone to, to, to do the locations. And what I'm going to do quickly is I'm going to bring up um, another slide just to show you where we're going uh, in terms of the places we're going in real life um, and just talk over those quickly and um, Mark I'm just going to come to you um, you know why is it we've chosen some of the places that we've chosen to do obviously we've got the five webinars but we're also doing you know quite a lot of um, quite a lot of other other places so I've just chucked, chucked up um, a list of some of the sites that we're going to be intended in real, real life all right, thanks for all. You see there's quite a lot of activity there. The, the drop-in events have been located um, to try and be fairly close to uh, major proposals in the local plan. So um, we, we're close to places like the Cambridge Biomed campus with the, um, the event we're having at uh, Clay Farm um, and, and so on. So if you look there, I think we're doing about six or seven drop-in events and I think I'll be out all bar one. So I would encourage anyone who's uh, near to one of those to consider popping in. Um, I don't want to be stuck in a village hall on my own for three or four hours. So please, please come and talk to me um, and we'll do some consultation the old fashioned way. Thanks very much, Mark. And, and I'm going to just pop up the last slide, which shows you some further details of how you can get involved while we just walk through a couple more questions. Uh, you know, um, um, what I think that, um, that we're trying to encourage people is to go through the website and go through, use the hashtag as much as possible. 
Um, you know, we obviously get comments about how, you know, being as inclusive as possible. Um, and I think we've had one in, in the chat. I don't think that we're, I think that we've tried to expand it as, as much as we can. We aren't reaching everybody. And, and it's a really, it's a real focus of all of us to try and, and to try and really improve that. But I think one of the key things is to explain to people why who don't really engage with this process, why it's relevant to them, because a lot of people, you know, certainly the younger age groups as well, who this plan is going to fundamentally affect and who also play a massive role in dealing with some of the challenges that it brings along, uh, you know, don't really understand it so much. So I think, you know, help, you can help us as well, those who have been here today and those who have been involved in the process before by spreading the word. Um, have I got any, before we leave, and I know we've gone over for five minutes, is there any final thoughts for the panel um, on, on this? And um, please do get in contact with us as well, but is there any final thoughts from any of you? It's been a really great discussion and lots of really great questions. Um, and we would definitely just encourage you to come to some of the, uh, that we see a few questions that aren't answered, we haven't had time to answer today. And I think one of the reasons why Paul hasn't answered them is they are, a lot of those gonna be covered in this growth and jobs and homes webinar that we're having next week. So if you're able to come, please do come to that. Um, and also there's lots and lots of information on our website and I would just encourage everyone to kind of have a look and explore that content um, because we, and, and, and if there are questions that aren't answered there, we will be adding them to the frequently asked questions section. So if something that you've asked today isn't broadly speaking covered in the FAQs, we are picking up all of those and we will add them to the, the frequently asked questions on our website. Um, so do have a, a quick look there. And I think what might be useful as well, Hannah, is I think there's only about six questions in the Q&A at the moment. We'll take those questions and bring them into the webinar for us next week as, you know, and, and yeah. you know, there'll be similar questions, I'm, I'm sure of that, so we can then pick them up. Um, Regarding North East Cambridge, we do have a dedicated webinar on that as well. So um, that's towards the end of the month. Um, we've got a dedicated North East Cambridge and local plan of online event. So if anyone is interested in exploring that in more detail, do just have a look at that details again on our website. OK, well, great. Well, listen, I'm sorry that we've run over by seven minutes, but, you know, we do want to get all of that information. It's great to have so much engagement already at the first starting point. I can see the numbers have dropped now to 27. So the 27 of you still here, thank you for seeing <laughs> you still. And thank you for attending and thank you for engaging and um, and your feedback's always valued. So have a lovely day. Have, enjoy your weekend. And thanks to the panel as well. And then we'll see some of you next week, hopefully.